If you are here for the very first time, welcome. If you're returning to us, welcome. Thank you for joining us again on a Friday. We're on a bit of a roll. We were here last week and we'll be here next week as well, which is always our pleasure and hopefully just a little bit of yours too. Every Friday, it's important to us to start with a moment to acknowledge and recognize where we are. And the picture that you're looking at on the screen right now is the view from Heritage Hall at our downtown Calgary, or not quite downtown, we're looking at downtown on our Calgary campus. But before we go to our recognition and acknowledgement, I thought it would make sense. We're going to talk about meetings. And at some point today, I have no doubt that we'll be talking about how we do much better when we talk in circles. Straight lines kill the conversation, circles initiate more conversation. And our general methods in meetings anyways really doesn't lend itself to interconnectedness. A tradition maybe, I'm not sure the right term for it, from our First Nations leaders is the idea of talking circles. And talking circles originated so that all leaders in council were heard and those speaking were not interrupted. So it's a great practice that we can learn from and build into our everyday practice as well with our own meetings. With that, Sait, for Craig and I here in Calgary, but wherever you are today, we acknowledge that we are situated on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Today, that encompasses the indigenous people of the Treaty 7 region. That includes the Siksika, the Pekane, the Ghana, the Sutina, the Stony Nakoda and the Northwest Métis homeland. State also acknowledges all of the people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. There you go. Thank Over you. To you. You're welcome. Yeah, so we're going to talk about meetings. We're talking about practice. Sorry, a bit of a Ted Lasso, Alan Iverson scene just popped into my head there. Anyway, um, Folks, you know, we 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 try on these Friday mornings to mix in some some various different things. Sometimes a little bit of um, leadership theory, I guess, if you want to put it that way. Sometimes conversations with other leaders who can help us think about our own leadership, uh, and other times some very practical conversations. And I think this morning might be one of those really practical ones. Not that the others are impractical. Um, but, you know, I think we might get a little bit more tactical. This reminds me a little bit, Jenny, of our conversation about effective business writing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with this episode today, we're, we're revisiting the very first episode that we ever did 42 times ago. Um, but folks, meetings, we all sit through them. We all suffer through them. Sometimes we sit through one that was actually... Uh, sometimes there's the occasional meeting you walk away from and go, oh, I actually left a little energized and learned something in that. Um, but I am very curious if you uh, would love to share with us in the chat some of the features of the worst meetings that you experience. Oh, I kick off to a Friday. <laughs> yeah, let's get it all out now because we I think most of us know Monday mornings or Tuesday mornings we're walking into one. Um, no purpose, no agenda, no outcomes. There, <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of negatives here. Uh, and Tim, you're usually a positive guy. Um, wow. You did ask one for person that. talking. Meetings about meetings. Oh, that's a good one. Mm. Off-topic discussions. Repeating the same thing. Yes. What's the purpose of your meeting? Right? Are you making a decision or not? We've really triggered some conversation here. People decided to have an argument and went back and forth. Hijackings. Okay. No follow-up, no follow-through, no engagement. Jenny, lots to pick from there. And that, this is rant. So Thomas is either talking about a meeting or talking about me when he says rambling, be concise. So um, <laughs> Jenny, your, your call in terms of where you want to, where you want to start here. Okay. Um, there's there's tons. I'll let you scan through them and, and bring us back. Yeah. The one I glanced at as I looked up was purpose. And that actually is a really good place to start because the purpose starts before, before the agenda. If you have to have an agenda, we can talk about that in a minute too. Because uh, agendas are a 
curious beast in themselves. But the the first step, I think, if you're going to hold a meeting, a meeting is about how how we come together and how we think together. And if you're going to hold a meeting, first step is just is your meeting necessary? Does it have to be a meeting? And so the meeting, if you if it's information, does that information require a dialogue? Because a lot of information doesn't require dialogue, therefore it doesn't have to be a meeting. If it's discussion, that's dialogue. We need a meeting. If it's decision, is there a dialogue prior to the decision, then we need a meeting. So first off, is it necessary? And then secondly, with that purpose, be absolutely crystal clear on what the purpose of the meeting is, because it will help to set you up for success on everything else. If you understand the purpose, then if you're going to have an agenda, you totally can make that agenda relevant to the purpose. If you know your purpose, you know who you need in the meeting, because we are dreadful for inviting the wrong people to the meeting, let alone the people who will attend a meeting that they don't need to be in. And if you understand the purpose, it's very easy to sort of create or analyze what is the decision making process so that everybody, when they come into that meeting, can understand that. Um, Andy Bounds, who's out of uh, works out of England, he's in sales, I believe, actually, says we should call them causings, not meetings. What are you going to cause to happen after the meeting that you're about to have? That is my starting point. Back to you. <laughs> causings. I, I haven't heard that one before. That's that's yeah. good. I like that. Um, yeah, it's interesting that like, this whole concept around purpose for meetings, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of it I don't know. Uh, to your point, I think some of us have standing meetings as a team that we lead or standing meetings as a team that we're part of. So this whole concept of the standing meeting. Um, mm -hmm. How do you build purpose into those? Because there, let's face it, there is, there is value. And I think we've all experienced this maybe over the last six, yeah. nine, 12 months as we've started to come back to work and trying to decided, you know, hybrid or in-person or remote, there is, there is some um, validity and meaning in getting together as a team, right? Yes. Just that socialization, that connection piece, doesn't need to be a formal meeting necessarily to your point about purpose. Um, but one thing that I think a lot about as we, as we talk about purpose is the purpose of these, of standing meetings. And I think when we went back to our kind of our original conversation, you know, this whole concept of the round table meeting, let's go around the table and see what everybody's doing. Right. Um, sometimes that's good. Sometimes there's value in that, but I, if, if I could walk away with something from today's discussion, Jenny, it's perhaps, you know, ideas, thoughts that we could take away for those standing meetings, because we know they're going to exist. Even though maybe they, even though maybe they shouldn't in some cases. So by standing, you mean the regular ones, like it's a yes, regular, sorry. Um, regular yeah. cadence, because we can yeah. stand and have a meeting. To and stand I, I'm, up. I, I'm doing um, it right now. There you go. And I would be too, but I'd be on the move too much for everyone. So let, let's just do that one quickly, because that's a really good quick infill. If your meetings are too long and they're regular, stand up to have the meetings. It's amazing how efficient we can get when we make everybody stand up. Um, and and when if you're working face to face, even better. Uh, the the hybrid virtual one probably a little bit of a different conversation, no doubt later today. The standing as in the regular meetings, the, one of the worst sort of wastes of time is we're having a meeting because we always have a meeting, or we're having a meeting because the room's booked, and and even worse, the room's booked for an hour, so we'll stretch that hour out to have a meeting. Right? Just take a look around you. What is the cost of that meeting? Are you making it worthwhile? So that's the first part is, is a standing meeting on the cadence that you have it necessary? And then this idea of bringing the team together with everything, if you're regular here, you've heard me say it 101 times, social capital, building psychological safety, there's an absolute purpose there. And this actually is one of the places where I don't know that an agenda is necessary. Hear me out okay. in that. If the leader sets the agenda a week ahead, 
you're predicting what will be important to the conversation on, let's say, Monday morning. Okay, if as a leader, that's important to you on Monday morning, and that's the next opportunity you have to talk about it, game on. That's on. That's your agenda. But there is an option where when we arrive into the room, either verbally or using the whiteboard or the flip chart, if you're working face to face, you can even do that remotely, of course, is what's important to you? What do we need to talk about today? And if your team, your general take is, oh, we'll look at you with deer in the headlights, kind of, uh, I'm not saying anything, then grab the either the virtual or the physical post-it note. Everybody write down something that needs to be discussed today. There's always the option to pass. Like if you really don't have anything, you really don't have anything. Most people have something that's burning for them. But by the time we've got through the agenda that was prescribed based on what we thought, there's not much time for that discussion. So that discussion is still happening elsewhere. And with a pattern to that, it encourages people to think of what is it? What are the questions we're not asking? What is the conversation that I'm not having? Once you've got everybody's ideas collectively, what's the priority to those topics? And then set that priority. And before you even start, what will we do if we don't get to items six and seven, if you're a seven person team? And there's, you know, are we going to carry on? Does everybody have the time? Or are we going to table those that will be a part of the conversation next week? And that encourages us to put the priority in the right place as well. It's a bold move. It works quite well. That's good. I, li I like that. You Some good comments here. You know, Lisa's called out, uh, that is the lean-in coffee meeting structure. Awesome idea as it pulls the meeting topics out of the agenda. I do like that. I don't think I've ever really tried that one before. I think some leaders, some organizations, especially now, if you are a team that is not perhaps in an office all the time and your regular meeting is once a week where you have people traveling in, mm -hmm. you might, I think you might want to make sure you do have perhaps something in your hip pocket as a leader to discuss for fear of no uh, nothing being offered and no post-it notes being filled out. Right? I... Uh... I'd go as far to say there's actually a bigger issue at hand if there's nothing to be discussed. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> either, either everything's going very well or there's a bigger trust psychological safety issue going on. <laughs> there you go. Um, and I noticed earlier, Tim, you had a great comment here. Uh, we have a manager who is great for canceling regular meetings when there are no agenda items. Hang on. Yeah. Right some point make the call and decide you know what's more important um the getting together or giving people the the luxury of luxury or the gift of time it's not really a luxury is it really and nice. and to your point too if you if you have people coming in we're working in this method a little bit where people are sort of coming in a day a week i think is the pretty much the the standard there's nothing for the team if you cancel that, but they're coming in, you still have that opportunity. If your meeting is two hours regularly, there's four half hour one-on-one -on -one opportunities for yeah. connection. And, and that doesn't have to be necessarily you and each of your team. Open up the invitation. You know, Jenny, sit with Craig, who works side by side, we're peers, and, and the two of you have a one-on-one. -on -one. What does that look like? And so, you know, we always think one-on-one -on -one as a leader, an employee, yes. And are your employees having one-on-ones? And is that on a regular cadence? Mm. And what would that result? I'm quite sure that's going to turn up some stuff for the next time we decide that we want to get face-to-face -face around the table. It, yeah. it, it comes down to, can we step outside and look at it differently? We're caught, we're caught in a horrible habit of, um, I forget who, who said this, Nancy Duarte, I think, said it, the bland leading the bland. So we're, we're constantly doing what we've always done, constantly. And but what will it take to get people to step out of this? Because if you look back, like this was our first conversation, 42, 3, 4 conversations ago. Yeah, year and a half and, ago. Yeah, and I'm still, we're still seeing consistent practices that people aren't happy with. And when you say things like we've already said this morning, I mean, no doubt we'll go further down this path. People look at you horrified. And it just takes that step to say, actually, what if we did it differently? What if there was a better way? Yeah, 
Well, in some organization, that takes a little bit of courage to be able to step up and say, what if we do this differently, right? It does. Especially if you are in an organization that has a, oh, I hate this phrase, a meeting culture. Right? <laughs> lots, of, lots of organizations have their meetings because they have their meetings. They do. Right? And so how do you, you're sometimes perhaps taking a risk as being the team that does it differently until you can actually show that it's working better. Mm. Right? I think that there is a, there's kind of a built-in inertia or a built-in fear, I think, to perhaps trying different approaches with meetings. But you know, at the end of the day, what's the worst outcome? Right? I, I don't think you're going to be any worse off because at the moment, what, what's the statistic? Like, I've got it somewhere, 20, oh, almost eight hours a week we spend in unnecessary meetings. As a, as a leader, almost eight hours a week. Well, that's a day's worth of good productive work. You and your meeting. If you're a leader with your team, your meeting's behind a closed door usually. If it doesn't work, and here's a part actually that often isn't followed: Are you evaluating your meeting? Like, are you checking what people thought at the end of it? Yeah, probably not. Well, there's another step that might. It may or may not be one of our strategies later today, actually. Oh, I was going to say, let's double click Spoiler. on that one a little. Let, you know, let's let's dive into that one a little bit because yeah. you know, I think yeah, that's an interesting habit that perhaps as a leader, you either just don't think of doing, run out of time to do. How often do we we have that hour meeting? We go, oh, we have a short agenda. This should be quick, and then all of a sudden it's uh, sixty one minutes, and yeah. we're still on the first topic because something happened. Or fear of asking for feedback on the meeting because you don't want to hear what it could be. Oh, that's an issue, kind of not an issue. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I have to credit my daughter with that expression. But the I think the key, okay, the key here is if if you don't ask, you won't ever know. And there's no way that you know as a leader, because we we need. We need the different perspectives as you let's let's just assume face to face, but it, it would be the same virtual that meeting will occur differently to everybody who's in the meeting. So if we're not sort of evaluating it. What, how can we learn, how can we make it better, and if this is constantly about what, how can we be better today than we were yesterday, we don't know that without that information, and I think when we say evaluation or you know, sort of feedback, to your point, we all get a little bit hesitant because sometimes that hurts. We take it personally. We just invested a time, an hour in that meeting, and we probably invested an hour preparing for that meeting, maybe. And so the way, you know, several ways you can do it really easily. The easiest one is at the end of the meeting, did we achieve what we set out to achieve? And that is one of the few times in a meeting where I would go round table, uh, potentially. I might not even then. If you want to upgrade it just a little bit, as you start the meeting, and I and I heard this the other day, it was kind of cool. How are you showing up today? How are you showing up to this meeting? Well, there's there's almost a FICA, a social capital check-in anyway. How are you people doing as we start this meeting? And then at the end, at leaving this meeting, how are you showing up for the rest of the day? It requires one word from everybody, but as a leader asking that question, you will receive a ton of information on two levels like Jenny shows up I'm frustrated coming into this meeting I'm leaving I'm energized I'm excited for the day you you now have that opportunity to come back and say Jenny frustration at the beginning of the meeting did the meeting solve that or is there another conversation that we need to have so there's there's a huge amount of information and two simple questions that if it's a one-word answer around the table that's not eating up a ton of your meeting time because we don't want to waste the time that we've got people together Right. And after that, you can go into a much longer version. The one that I have later today will be really quick on this one, but there's four L's. So what did you like? What did you learn? And now I can't remember them. Um, I might even have to have a look. <laughs> uh, what did you like? What did you learn? What lacks today? And what are you longing for in our meeting? I think those four L's come from Atlassian originally. Um, that's a much bigger evaluation. And the way that you do that, you could even do it asynchronous, <clears throat> excuse me, asynchronously after the meeting. That's good. That's good. Yeah, because you need to think about the the tools and when you could use them and how, how you can best use them. 
Sorry, you made me giggle at the word longing. I was in a meeting earlier this week where we were trying to define some core values for a team and we worked through a tool and the, the core value that came out was long game um, as in long-term view, but mm -hmm. I had heard, I'd heard it said as longing. And I thought that was the very strangest core value that we could have for a team. But anyway, it's very <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> Yeah, made me laugh too. A uh, couple of questions here. Um, I, I find I'm in a meeting where one or two people need the same information over and over again. How can I encourage others to keep up so the meeting doesn't go longer than it needs to? Mm. Mm. <laughs> so it, these, these are harder because it's obviously context specific to the person and to the meeting. If you're the leader, and the same information is being asked of you again and again, especially within the same meeting. I always say this, come this way first, because the only consistency in people not getting that information, if you're giving it, is you and the way that you're giving it. So how are you giving that information? And if it's important, then it's important that everybody gets it. And depends on the team and the dynamics within the team perhaps someone else can explain it from their perspective that might connect there as well like you know, own it <laughs> you know I'm, I'm stuck <laughs> this is the best I can give and, and you know Craig you seem to you seem to have sort of caught on to this can you offer a different perspective on how this can be given if it's a case of you gave information prior to the meeting and people aren't keeping up because they didn't read that information prior to the meeting, come this way first. When did you send that e uh, email out or that information out? Because if you sent it the night before at eight o'clock in the evening and you're meeting at nine o'clock the next morning, that's not fair. That's on you. And so we need time to go through that properly. If you send it out a clear time before the meeting and it's on them because they didn't read it, now we're into that. And we've used this expression loads before too. You get what you tolerate. So are you going to make time and allow them to catch up? Well, you just said to everybody, don't read the information I send out before the meeting because I'll prop you up here and support you. So that's a that's a pretty interesting decision. And if you decide to run like run forward with it, then that's a one-on-one -on -one call in later. You know, I noticed that you weren't able to be up to speed. What stopped you from being prepared today? And, and there's that learning piece. We if we're going to change the way that we meet, we have to help and teach people to come with us on that because we're changing habits and some of those habits have been ingrained for years. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. A um, couple other quick ones. I think earlier, Jenny, you mentioned causings. Who was the person you were referencing there? Was it Somebody's caught it. It's Andy Bounds. And oh, it looks like they put a link into the chat too, which would be... Um, believe the right one perfect and well the chat there uh another question what if you work in a team where email communication isn't prioritized i'd love to be there um so you might communicate something via email that doesn't require a meeting but then no one reads the email so you end up to have to end up having to set up a meeting discuss anyway Any thoughts? and now we understand why the world is frustrated <laughs> um so if you are a leader and your email is important, what are you doing to tell your team that the email is important? Because if you just send an email, most of us are getting, I don't know what, 60 to 100 emails a day. And let's be fair, most of us are reading them on our phone and we're reading down the middle do something, don't do something. We're, we're overloaded. We're overloaded with information. So how are you helping that email to stand out and helping your team to know how important that email is? And that's pretty much it. Again, we've got, we've got to educate people. You've got to help them to get there. Once you've got the pattern and the cadence, it becomes easier. But we can't, you can't just send something and expect. Like it, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. I think there's also a piece around um, agreeing to some standards and expectations as a team. 
uh, and being willing to call somebody out when they're missing the mark. We just went through this on our team where we, we were trying to minimize email flow by keeping internal communication on teams. We're trying very hard just to talk amongst our team within teams. And uh, Jenny called me out rightly the other day when I sent something out by email, and I got a private message. This was day two of this new, uh, new world order. And she said, I think you might have meant to send that by Teams. It wasn't even a, a statement. It was a question. And uh, that was very good. So being, you know, being willing to, to call that out when it, it's not there. It's not going to happen overnight, clearly, because oh. it literally was the next day. So it didn't happen. <laughs> um, what can you do in a meeting where the decision maker is not in attendance to ensure all information is captured and passed along? My first question is why isn't the decision maker in attendance? Um, right. no, no need to answer. But you know, when we think about who are we inviting to the meeting, if the decision's going to be made, let's have the decision maker in the meeting. Uh, in terms of capturing it, these days you can record it, I suppose. The yeah, there's a lot to be said. We, you know, is there is there a um, other meeting minutes, other action items? You know, what are we causing to happen? So if we're causing something to happen, then there at bare minimum will be a list of action items. And anytime there's an action item, there's a person and a deadline, timeline, do by line, whatever that looks like. For, so there's there's just clarity after the meeting because if if you're attending six meetings in a day, you haven't got much time to get the work done. So the more that we can narrow that focus, the better. Be really careful with minutes. You know, the old style of minutes was this entire essay of what everybody said and felt and who ate which donut when. Like that was the old sort of style of minutes. I don't think there's the need for that anymore. But if it is the case that the decision maker can't be in there, a conversation with the decision maker prior to the meeting, what do you need to make this decision? Yeah. And then that helps us to ensure that we're on track and providing the information. Yeah, and I would think if you can't have that pre-conversation as opposed to find out what is needed, um, you're probably just as well off to cancel that meeting. Is your right. meeting necessary and what's the purpose? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it might have a purpose and it might be necessary, but if you can't generate what is required. So I, I don't know, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, here we go. This Jenny, and I think I know where your answer is going to go on this one. We have a culture <laughs> of meetings that, no, we have a culture of meetings. At, we have a culture of meetings after the meeting where employees won't speak up during the meeting, but then discuss afterwards, causing extra churn and time. Or time and churn, I guess my. Yeah, so it's abs a silent culture is never a good culture. It's simple, and the what this is in black and white is a lack of psychological safety. So that's a much much bigger conversation for the team, uh, or actually for the leader to start with, and then for the team. Sometimes when we think about it, our meetings are geared, they're, they're sort of pro extroverts. They're all sort of based around talking based techniques, holding stage, speaking in front of lots of people if it's a bigger team. And, and that's, that's not everybody. And you know, we can talk about the ones who do all the talking in a moment for sure. So what are you doing to help get information from other people in the room. Sometimes it's not necessarily a complete lack of psychological safety. It's just the way that the meeting is set up. And so you know, we were talking about this yesterday with a group that I was working with actually. And one of our participants was saying, we, we needed more people to challenge. There just, there wasn't that um, productive challenge happening in the meeting. And a good meeting has tension in it. A good meeting yeah. is just a little bit gritty. There's there's not really much lovely about it. And so at that point, how do you get that productive challenge? Well, if we sit around with 12 people around a table and you're waiting for one to speak up, there's so many different human pieces behind that speak up that that can stall the conversation. So as a facilitator of that meeting, when you hit that uh, moment, 
is, you know, I, I'm sensing a change in the energy here. This is the question. Let's break into two. So we've got 12 people around the table. You know, turn and talk to the person next to you. What's the real challenge here? And, and the real challenge is, is there something that's stopping us from answering the question? Or what is the answer to the question? You, you have five minutes, the two of you together, let's get something. I may go back to a post-it note. I'm the post-it note queen, unfortunately. But you know, even in your books or a note or whatever that is, you can stop laughing now. <laughs> and and But grab that between the two people. And then what answers do we have? And in that, what answers do we have? A quick choice there as a facilitator, are you going to go to a quieter pair who have now had time to think, distill, and get something down on paper between them? Or are you going to go to a voice that's really happy to kick the ball off and start going? And, and at that moment, now we're rolling into a structure that allows conversation because potentially we could hear six different answers to that question. And without interruption, here, here's what we've written down. Here's what we've written down. Here's what we've written down. Now, uh, educated guests, we have a platform to take off from again and, and start that conversation again. Yeah, I, I like that. And it kind of, I think it touches on the next question that we had here from uh, Jeannie. What do you do with meetings? Uh, sorry, what do you do with meetings called for stakeholder input and collaboration? And when you ask questions that they have time to prepare for, you get dead air. Even to yes, no, let alone open answers. So uh, other other approaches, because I think what you just just touched on there, you know, turn and talk in pairs, post it notes. Any other any other tools, tips so really that you would suggest? One. Yeah, here's, here's your practical piece. The the um, a popular one that we use when we're social intelligence is the one we attach it to in leading beyond, which is sort of hiding behind this whole. Friday morning. And, and it's called a conversation cafe. So I think you said in the question there, there was preparation time. People knew what was coming. And so the way that a conversation cafe would work, it, careful with your numbers here, it, five or more. If you have a big group, have two groups going within there. So look at the venue where you're holding your meeting. And the way that a conversation cafe works is with the first question, one minute each and it involves a talking a talking stick and that talking stick can be anything I commonly have stress balls in my bag just because of teaching communication so we'll often throw a ball within the meeting and so I start I get one minute and based on the question my preparation my thought I give my minute and then I throw the ball to you Craig across the table that's your minute and then you throw the ball they get a minute the person with the talking stick or whatever it might be uninterrupted the time is yours but it's a minute so if you use 30 seconds you use 30 seconds if you use a minute you use a minute if you pass you pass although that's not what we're trying to build here so the first round is one minute each then the second round do it again for one minute and it's a yes and round so it might be that i want to finish my perspective Yes, and I'd like to add to what I said before, and there's my minute. Or I may be particularly caught by somebody else's perspective on this. So my second minute might be, yes, and Craig, I really liked what you said and would add this. And that happens again. So we've had 10 minutes. Like This is time. You can't do this without time, but this is, this is good conversation. And then after those two first rounds, then the discussion ensues. And the discussion, you can still use the talking stick, but it's a, it's not in an order. And then to close, and this is crucial, one more round of either thank you, or here's what I'm leaving with, or here's what connected for me. And actually, we ran it recently in an intact team at SAIT, and the leader running it you know, the expression, the term that she used at the end was, I learned more in that 20 minutes than I would have ever learned in any other method. So it was 20 minutes out of an hour's meeting and it generated actually a ridiculous amount of information. It was very cool the way that it took off. And it's because we just gave people the space to come with their thoughts and then discuss all of those thoughts. Mm -hmm. 
and the preparation time allowed even the quietest thinker to be able to deliver their perspective on that too. So as a conversation cafe, it's a liberating structure, um, which is a huge thing all of its own. And we, we can pop the link in our extra resources for the people who are here today. Oh, very good. The talking sick, I just think of the conch from Lord of the Flies. It's a totally different conversation. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I tend to decline meetings that do not have an agenda. Good practice, in my opinion. Uh, what suggestion can you make to an organization that doesn't prioritize meeting etiquette? So if you're a leader, prioritize your meeting etiquette. Start with a conversation with your team and like involve them because the more we're part of the creation, the more we own it, the more we will live into it. Yeah. And so it doesn't all have to come from you. Involve them. Like the this is time. This is money. Like that's a really good thing to do in a meeting anyway. Just add up what you think the individual salary for that hour could be around the table, right? Now, would you spend that? If that was your budget line, would you spend that? And so, you know, involve them. Have that conversation. What does it look like to us? And then what are the what are the items from there that as a team you can commit to? I would start there. If you are an individual contributor and you don't feel that you have that authority, that power, when you show up as an individual contributor, you, you have value. And so you can take responsibility for the outcomes. If the conversation's got off down a sidetrack, usually some kind of question or a comment along the lines of, are we talking about what we need to talk about here? Mm. or or simply you know I, I respect that everybody here is busy I'm going to suggest that we come back to the agenda so that we can cause something to happen at the end of this as an individual contributor you can always take responsibility for the outcomes I like that that's good um Slightly off topic, but curious how you would respond to someone who constantly cuts people off mid-sentence or talks louder on top of people speaking, uh, leader included, when you're in the meeting. Uh, little caveat here is one-on-one -on -one conversations have already happened about this. If you're the facilitator of that meeting, twice today, you get what you tolerate. So you've got to nip that one in the bud as soon as possible and it sounds like it depends on your relationship with that person it might sound like Craig I appreciate your passion for this conversation Jenny's in the middle of a thought let's let her finish I'll come to you next you're, it's your meeting you're chairing that meeting own that meeting if your individual contributor you hold the responsibility for the outcomes and you hold the respect probably for your colleagues. So it it's a courage step and we're, and we're weighing up that risk. So that's the context piece. I can't speak to that. You know what the risk is in, in saying something there. But it might be along the lines in the meeting, you know, I love the energy in this room and I'm really cognizant that we're not allowing each other to finish each, our sentences. Can we finish sentences today? And, and I think in those kind of, methods we can avoid the blame and shame and that's what kicks the emotional intensity up all the time but we can hold people accountable yeah I mean, there's kindness and accountability i truly really believe that yes. one uh, yeah. and i think that you know that same approach also works for folks who pull out their phones or folks who have their laptops oh, open taking absolutely. notes yep yeah, absolutely i'm taking notes you're not you're doing your email um, right. So I think that it's an, it can be awkward, but I think once you do it a couple of times, hold yes. people accountable to meeting etiquette, it, it becomes practice. Or if there truly is something important going on, we have to realize, you say this all the time, Jenny, everybody walks in with their own story. Yeah. If you've done yeah. that check-in at the start, maybe there's something going on and somebody could say, you know, my one word check-in is concerned because son or daughter or partner is sick and 
they happen to be on their phone, maybe that's what you might have a little grace in that moment. Uh, yeah. But holding people accountable, I think, is huge. And, and you can have grace in holding people accountable too. Like these, yeah. that we we hold them as scary words. And you know, to your point, it, it that's kindness. Yeah. You know, and I, I've, I've been guilty of this too. I found myself earlier this week in a meeting where I was probably ancillary to the meeting, probably shouldn't have been invited and found myself, you know, paying attention to the buzzing in my pocket more than the table. I probably should have just excused myself from the meeting and said, I, I don't really need to be here. Mm -hmm. um, but because the message that you send by sitting there and still being present, but not being present probably isn't a good one either so well, we're always projecting something so yes. yeah yeah and and calling people not calling them out but holding them accountable the longer you let that go uh the more acceptable that behavior comes in a meeting and more difficult yes. it becomes to over and again again we're, so we're teaching people as to yeah. what's coming up. yeah 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 uh, we have a culture of everyone needs to collaborate and have input Ensure you have everyone uh, and, and ensure you invite everyone to CYA. Mm -hmm. How can we start to shift that? Oof. <laughs> Oof. Uh, <laughs> Oof. So it comes down to who you're inviting. So two, two parts to this, actually. Who are you inviting to the meeting? So in, and again, actually, it's a bit of an Andy Bounds day. He has a good sort of graphic of this, but if we've got six people around, if it, if I should come back, if it's just you and me, you and me have to agree. If we add one other person, those number of lines go up. And so if you've got eight people around the table, the number of agreement lines, if we're making a decision, it just intensifies. So by expanding that invite list, you're really slowing down the productivity and the effectiveness of your meeting. So who is crucial to the conversation? And be careful in there that you're actually including the people who will disagree with you as well. Because again, we, we need the tension, we need the grittiness to get the productive work done. If you are invited to a meeting, rather than just clicking yes, because you have a hole in your calendar, and, and, and we feel nice because we feel good because somebody liked us enough to invite us. Sort of rule of thumb, if you're in the optional line, they don't want you at the meeting, don't accept that. But you can ask for the minutes. You can ask for, you know, what happened. Absolutely. No, there's probably no need to go if you're in the optional line. Second thing you can do is how many people from your team are attending? And, and is it crucial that you have three people from your team there? Because it's three of you in the same hour hearing the same information. That's a productivity Ooh. equation that may or may not be a good thing. And, and that depends on the kind of meeting and the kind of work that's happening. And then once you decide, okay, I am crucial to this conversation and I'm going to go, then what is the value and the contribution that you will bring to that conversation? Because then how we show up, how we walk in that door changes because we know that we have value in that conversation. Very good. That was that, that was a great way to bring it home, Jenny. Love it. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. I, I, I've, I've, I've probably taken more notes from, from you this week than uh, many others. So it, it's great. Um, cool. But it is quarter to nine. And Ooh, we need to likewise. wrap things up and let people get on with potentially shoveling their driveways today. Uh, it shouldn't be that bad. And we had so many things that I thought we'd talk about. We didn't get there. <laughs> um, okay, where are we heading to? 11. There we go. So as always, just in case you're new to Friday mornings, we leave you every Friday when we're here and when it's our conversation. If we have a guest, we do it slightly differently. With one big idea, two things that you can take away and use immediately, additional usually to the conversation that we've had, there's probably a few already, and then three questions just to contemplate as you roll on with your weekend and of course your meetings next week. So the big idea, this is not new, but let's step outside the box. How can you do this differently? How can you do it better? It is absolutely possible. Right back to your point at the beginning of the morning, Craig, Every now and then we can leave energized and inspired. Well, what if that was the case 
with the majority of meetings rather than just a couple. So it lies with our leaders, facilitators to start that process, but as we said earlier, to involve the people in the meeting. That's a really big part of meeting culture. Two uh, strategies, that's your end result if you, if you follow that line. Two strategies to take away. Uh, be the host. We don't talk about this enough. If you are hosting a dinner party in your home, you don't leave people on the driveway until you decide to open the door. And so, you know, in a virtual meeting, are you keeping people in the waiting room right up till the last minute? Are you turning up at the last minute and then just starting the meeting with no introductions, no reasons why people are there, no appreciation for your guests? It's not a wonder that you're probably not held in too high esteem for your meeting. So be the host, welcome your people in, introduce them to each other if they don't know each other. Be, be thankful that they're there. They're about to value, you know, add value to this conversation. What is the value that you see them bringing? The more we understand about the people around the table, the more likely we are to buy into the conversation. And if we're introduced properly and our value is set up, the more likely we are to speak and to speak with a purpose. So this really, really lies on us. Be the host. Uh, really, you know, imagine that they're coming to your house within degree of reason. We are in the workplace. I get that. The second one, we did talk about this already, but it would be retrospective. I, this evaluates what's happening. This doesn't have to be done every meeting. It can. And especially that last one, the four L's, that's probably once a quarter, I would suggest, when you actually decide to stop and look back for the sake of setting up for the future. We spoke about all of these earlier, so I won't dwell on those. And then three questions. I kept it to three, almost. There's always a catch. Uh, but this is a good one for us to think about. Like, what are we attending that's reoccurring? You had a great point earlier this morning, Craig, around those standing meetings. Is that reoccurring allowing us to be productive and do our best work? And so if we simply sort of come back and say, what meetings as a team do we need in order to do our best work? That really helps us understand what we should attend and what we need to set up. And does the purpose of your meeting match the structure of your meeting? I had a slide in here. We never got there. But whoever named the boardroom, the boardroom was a genius. Like board. <laughs> <laughs> there's only a certain few meetings that can belong in a boardroom because we all file in we sit next to our best friend who thinks like us talks like us it's probably the same place every week <laughs> it's not a wonder we don't get very far so yeah. sorry, that's a good place to to start and look at the structure but of course we wanted to leave with one more question so Craig I'm going to let you answer this question but I'll pose it there you go yeah. What do a classically trained opera singer, the CEO of a 165-year-old Canadian company, and a six-time Stanley Cup champion have in common? Um, those are our next three guests that we have coming up April 28th, next Friday. Iggy Damagalski from uh, Wayjax will be joining us. Aaron Corbett, uh, who is the opera singer of the group uh, and the head of school and CEO of West Island College, will be joining us and on May 26th. Uh, Kevin Lowe. Uh, from the Edmonton Oilers will be uh, on on screen with us. And uh, I'm a little excited about all three of these. So uh, yeah. really looking forward to that. And folks, thank you so much for joining us once again. We, uh, we really appreciate it. The comments and the conversation that you helped create here really make these come alive. So uh, thank you once again and have a great Friday. Have an okay. excellent Friday, everyone. And enjoy your meetings next week or even today. Or feel free to cancel some. Like, so. <laughs> there you go. There you but go. don't quote us on that one. <laughs> exactly. All right. <laughs> Take care, everybody. Take care. Have a good weekend, everyone.